welcome everybody to Renovate. Why don't we stand together? We're so glad to be here together with you. If you're online, we're glad that you're here with us. We're going to worship God tonight. Amen? Let's do it. chains into our freedom Pretty good. You guys can go ahead and have a seat real quick. 
Uh, welcome to Renovate. Uh, man, we missed you guys. It's good to see um, everyone here. Thanks for worshiping with us tonight. If you are new, uh, welcome. Um, we want you to know, though, that what you're walking into uh, is a room full of very broken people. Uh, but we are a, a people who acknowledge that and we rally and celebrate the fact that we have a God who has gone to, to unbelievable lengths to take broken people and make them whole. And so tonight is a celebration of that truth. And so, uh, so glad that you chose to worship alongside us. Um, if you're new and trying to find some, some ways to get more connected, uh, a couple ways to do that. The first is to fill out a Connect card. And you can do that by texting Connect to the number up on the screen. Um, and when you fill out that card, someone will reach out to you, uh, get to know you and your story, uh, and really just try to make this big room feel a little bit smaller. Um, so make sure you go ahead and do that. Um, another way is to join one of our Renovate groups. And you can do that by texting Group to that same number. Um, we won't meet in this room again until February 24th, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, what happens in this room ha doesn't get to happen for the other three weeks. We, uh, we move everything to uh, essentially renovate groups, um, and we're really excited about this semester specifically because we're going to be walking through a series called The Kingdom, um, and it's going to be a series on the Sermon on the Mount, and, and, and why we're so excited is because I don't know if you know this, but there's a right way and a wrong way to follow Jesus. Um, and I know that in a you-do-you you culture, that's a, an unpopular idea. But when Jesus showed up on the scene, he was very, very clear that, that, that to be his follower, to be a citizen in the kingdom of God, there are certain expectations for how we're called to navigate this world as his representatives. And so um, we're, we're going to spend the entire semester walking through what does it actually look like and what, what does it actually mean to be a citizen in the kingdom of God? Are we actually following Jesus the correct way? Um, and so um, all of that content will be in groups and so you don't want to miss that. And so again, that's a uh, group to 682-200-0012. Um, and so if you're not in a group, you need to be in a group because it's going to be incredible. Um, on a side note, if you hear that and that sounds like, man, group life seems like a lot, it's kind of daunting. Uh, we have this thing called Open Group that's a, a, a three-week group experience that kind of allows you to test the waters um, a little bit before you jump straight in. So you can also uh, get in one of those at the same number as well. That was a lot. Here's what's about to happen next. We're going to enter back into worship. And one of the things that we're going to talk a lot about in this series is where our allegiances lie. Um, and we're about to, to sing a song that makes a really bold Declaration, and, and that declaration is that we are a people who are willing to follow Jesus anywhere. That our allegiance is to him and to him alone, and we're going to follow him whatever that takes, whatever that looks like. And I don't know about you, but, but so often when I, I walk into rooms like this, I, I sing lyrics because they're up on a screen. And not necessarily because I'm um, aware of what I'm singing or because I'm actively thinking about the words that I'm declaring. And so uh, what I want to do tonight is I just want to orient our hearts for a moment as we go into worship and, and think about that idea that, that, that when we sing, that when we bold, boldly declare that I'm, I'm going to follow Jesus uh, anywhere he asks me to go, anywhere that he leads me, that, that that's a truth that, that's actually true of our lives. And if it's not, that it's something that stops us in our tracks and makes us take a step back and say, all right, like what's... What's going on in my heart? Because we really do want to be people who, who boldly pledge our allegiance to this God and say, hey, wherever you call me to go, I'm willing to go. And so I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. And so as we sing, let's, let's just be people that are introspective about that truth. Let me pray. Father, you are uh, worthy of being fo followed. You are worthy of our allegiance. Um, the fact that... Uh, when we were far from you, the fact that while we were still uh, in sin, you sent your son, that you don't wait for us to, to clean ourselves up, that, that you sent your son in, in the midst of our sin to save and redeem the, re the relationship that we broke. God, may, may that truth stir our hearts in a way that makes us realize that you are so worthy of our allegiance, so worthy of our affection, so worthy of uh, our fellowship. So God, will you um, move tonight? Will you stir our hearts? Will you open our eyes to see you in a new way? And, and may the words that we sing um, be true. May we have the, the boldness to declare a really difficult statement of saying, wherever you call me to go, wherever you lead, I'm, I'm gonna follow you. So God, will you do a work in our hearts tonight as we sing to you, as we worship to you? God, be, be present in this place. We love you, we thank you. You are worthy of our praise. It's in your son's name we pray, amen.
Let's stand together. it easy to love you you are good and you are kind you bring joy into my life you make it easy to trust you you have never left my side you've been faithful every time Oh, all I want is you, Jesus. All I want is you. You are the refuge I run to. You are the fire that leads me through the night. I'll follow you. a million reasons to trust you nothing to fear for you are by my side I'll follow you anywhere oh Jesus you came to my rescue took my place upon the cross you redeemed what I had lost now my whole world revolving around you Yes, you're the center of my life You're the treasure, you're the pricing church All I want is you Jesus, all I want is
Sing this together. So here I stand, high and surrendered. I need you now, Lord. So hold my heart now and forever. My soul cries out. Here I praise, Lord. Here I stand, high and surrendered. I need Hold my heart now and forever. My soul cries out. Once I was born. Your grace holds that ground, and your grace holds me 
Thank you for that grace that allows us to stand and surrender surrender in awe of you, Lord. Um, I praise you for your word and for your teachings. I pray um, that the same truth that you spoke over people 2,000 years ago will carry the same weight and the same truth today in this room um, so that our hearts can look more like you and our lives look more like you, Lord. Um, I love you so much. Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Uh, we love you, Renovate. We missed you. Um, man, I hope, uh, I hope that we sing this song about his grace and our chains being gone from us and that we believe that. That's been our hope and our prayer for you guys even through this break uh, and for our own souls. Uh, hey, we are going to be in the book of Matthew tonight. Uh, the book of Matthew. So if you've got your Bibles, uh, head there. We're also going to put the verses up on the screen if that's easier for you. Uh, when I was a young lad, I traveled a ton. Uh, I got to travel a lot and, and, would, and would move around. Uh, and I spent, uh, I spent about a semester abroad. And when I came back uh, to the States, I really wanted to see my buddies. And so this was, you know, I was 19 or 20 years old and I really wanted to see my friends. And so I had called them up and two of my best friends in the world, Adam and Brian, and I was like, man, let's hang out. And they're like, yeah, we wanna see you. We wanna catch up. Man, we miss you. It's been like six months. I was like, yeah, let's hang out. And they were like, ah, the problem is we got girlfriends and like our girlfriends wanna hang out with us. And I didn't have a girlfriend. So I was like, ah, oh, okay. Well, and they're like, no, no, we wanna see you. It's been a while. We'll figure something out. So sure enough, they figure some stuff out and then they call me later and they're like, we're doing it, man. We're getting a big group together. And we're all gonna hang out. So We'll pick you up. So they picked me up and they dragged their girlfriends with them. And then we picked up this other girl, Cheryl, and she wasn't super tight in our friend group, but that's cool. She was fun gal. And so we all get together and we go eat Tex-Mex and we're eating food and having a good time. And then we're like, let's go back to Adam's house and play pool. So we go back after dinner and play pool. And then Adam, cause he's got a movie room next to his game room cause his life is hard. <clears throat> so we were like, man, yeah, let's watch a movie. And so they put on a movie and Started watching a movie. It was a, a movie I remember vividly. Um, the movie was Cats and Dogs. Uh, it's a really stupid movie. Um, it's a movie about talking dogs. It's kind of like Saving Private Ryan, but with talking cats and dogs and not World War II and dumb. And so that's basically what it was. And so we were watching dogs and cats and, and the good dogs battling the evil cats. And, <clears throat> and then I look over and my buddy... You know, we'd, had a, we'd already had a long evening, but my buddy Adam was on the couch and he was asleep. And then his girlfriend was next to him on the couch and she was asleep and looked over on the love seat and Brian, you know, was asleep, lazy. And then his girlfriend was asleep <clears throat> and I was watching the movie and then I felt it. Cheryl was next to me. I could feel her staring at me. I could feel it. Like it was, I was watching the movie and I was like, oh, don't take your eyes off the movie. But I could feel, she was like, probably 15 to 15 and a half inches from my face, just, just looking right at me. And that's when I realized, guys, I was on a date. <laughs> I was not aware that I was on a date up to that point. Uh, the previous four hours I had been on a date, but I was the only person unaware. And as I realized, okay, my buddy over there and his girlfriend and oh, this is a date with Cheryl. Cheryl knew it was a date, but nobody told Ben it was a date. So there I was, Cheryl, 15 and a half inches from my face. I'm watching Cats and Dogs. Horrible movie, but I'm pretending I'm really engaged because if I turn, that 15 and a half is gonna get cut by like three or four inches and we're gonna be so close and you know what happens, babies. So <laughs> I, just, I just stayed glued, stayed glued to Cats and Dogs and I did what any coward would do as a 19, 20 year old coward. I quickly pretended to also fall asleep. 
And then I spent the last hour, which by the way, Cats and Dogs sucks as a movie. It sucks even more if you can't even see it. If you're only listening to it, it's even worse because you can't see the animated dogs moving their mouth. So, <clears throat> so I pretended to fall asleep and then we all like woke up at the end of the movie and oh yeah, okay, we should probably get people home. Uh, it was awful. This story doesn't have a, I mean, it has a good ending. Cheryl got married later and has kids and she's fine. The point was, <clears throat> uh, which I feel bad that it took me like four hours to realize we were on a triple date. And they had told her, the ho- that's how horrible my friends are. They're like, hey, Ben wants to go on a date with you. It'll be a triple date. We'll all do it. <clears throat> that was the only way they could get their girlfriends to hang out. Horrible people. Um, but that, that's what it was. <clears throat> when, you, when you realize that, here's the sad thing. I know that some version of that has happened to people in this room, right? You hung out with somebody and then about halfway through the night, hopefully not four hours, hopefully you're not as, as obtuse and dense as me, but I, hopefully at some point you realize, oh my goodness, it's a date, really poor leadership, bro, really lack of clarity here. Um, but when that happens, it is the most awkward horrifying thing, right, when that happens. And it's awful because you realize, really, I just thought I was having a good time with my friends who cared about me, but you realized everything up to that point was just a lie from hell, right? The Tex-Mex, the pool game, it was all a lie, it was all a sham. And so it totally shades your perspective of what you see. Now, what's about to happen, really, in this series of Sermon on the Mount, is this idea of Jesus Christ in the Sermon on the Mount is going to let us know what his game plan is. He is going to sit down with his people and have a DTR and explain, this is who I am and this is what I'm doing. He's going to unpack all of that. The Sermon on the Mount is three chapters in the book of Matthew. It's Matthew chapter five, chapter six, and chapter seven. And it's a sermon that Jesus preaches. And I don't think I'm allowed to have a favorite chapter or verses, but if I was, I think the Sermon on the Mount, those three chapters, five, six, and seven in Matthew, are probably some of the most significant passages in our faith Uh, as believers. And so that's why we're spending uh, this entire semester just in his sermon and unpacking the context of who he is and what he's having us do and what this whole thing is that he's signed up. And, And like Josh said in the intro, man, there is a right way to follow him and a wrong way to follow him. And he's giving that correction. And that's really where we're going. And so tonight, uh, tonight, I just want to, I just want to set the hook on, on the context of his sermon. And so tonight we'll spend most of our time in chapter four, because next week in your renovate groups, you will open up chapter five, verse one, and dig into the the first 12 verses uh, of the Sermon on the Mount. And so tonight what's going to happen is I'm going to hopefully shed some clarity and context uh, for the sermon he's about to preach. Jesus is about to preach And then I'm going to look at the dangers if we are getting it wrong and looking at where that comes from and seeing in scripture, man, how we can get it wrong and how we can kind of be going along and totally unaware of what's actually happening and being dragged along and, and, and the dangers of that. And then I'm going to get uh, real personal and get in your face on some stuff and, and hopefully uh, God does what he wants to do with it. So Matthew chapter four, verses 12 uh, through 16. Uh, this is right after Jesus had, um, had been baptized. And so we've got the genealogy of Christ. He's born, um, he, he's grown up, and now he has gone and been baptized by John the Baptist, come out of the water. And this is really the beginning of his ministry. And so, so this, I, I just want us to set up before we even get to the Sermon on the Mount next week. Here we go. Now, when he, meaning Jesus, when he heard that John had been arrested, He withdrew into Galilee and leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum by the sea in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali so that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. And then this is a part of the prophecy in Isaiah. The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people dwelling in darkness have seen a great light. And for those dwelling in the region and shadow of death, on them a light had dawned. Here's what, one thing I want to do real quick uh, for you, because I want you to see the context of how sweet this is. Because Matthew is referencing a prophecy being fulfilled in Isaiah chapter 9. And you don't have to flip there, but I'm going to read to you what is a couple of verses later that all of the Jewish people who would have understood where Jesus was starting his ministry, what he did, where he was, he went back to Galilee and, and where he was in that area, they would have remembered 
the prophecy. Like they would have grown up reading this. They would have seen Jesus through the context of Isaiah 9. And and Isaiah 9, Matthew quotes, but look what else it says that they would have been thinking about. In that same passage, this fulfillment of prophecy, verses 6, it says this. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. And listen listen to this language. And the government shall be on his shoulders. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. And so what they would have seen is they would have remembered that language. They would have seen Jesus begin his ministry, usher in his ministry, get baptized and say, okay, I'm gonna start my, and the geography would have brought them back to this idea of, wait a second, our Messiah, who's gonna come and establish this unending government sitting on the throne of David, maybe, maybe that's what Jesus came to do. And so Matthew then goes on to tell us with Jesus' words exactly what Jesus came to do. What Jesus came to do, we see in verse 17, as he begins preaching his first sermon and and his first message to his people. He says in verse 17, chapter four, from that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, and here was his message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What did Jesus come to do? If we're gonna understand the context of the next five chapters that we're gonna spend the next 19 weeks in, we've gotta understand what did he came, come to do? He came to bring about his kingdom. That's why Jesus came. He came to bring about his kingdom. He did not come to start a religious club that we could all be a part of. He did not come so that we would accept him into his heart. Jesus' message was never, I've never found his message where he said, hey, I'm here so that you can accept me into your heart. I don't know what that means. I don't know what that means and I don't know where we get that. He he didn't come to establish a a moralism where, where we try to balance the scales in favor of doing more good than more bad. He came to establish a king, a, a kingdom and to rule and to reign in his kingdom. And he asks for our allegiance. That's what he does. That's what he does all throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He say, I have a kingdom. And he is saying, will you pledge your allegiance to the kingdom that I am building? So for the next 19 weeks, that's what we study when we study the Sermon on the Mount. We'll we'll see a, a shadow of it tonight. And we'll have some application tonight of how we walk out of here with our hope in the right place. But what happens over the next 19 weeks and our hope and our prayer as you dig deep in these three chapters is that we will figure out what it looks like exactly to have our allegiance aligned with the correct king. Um, let, me tell you, let me tell you a little bit more of the story and I'm just gonna walk us all the way right up to chapter five because I, I, I think it's incredible and I think it's, an, it's so timely even for our culture what he does here. Look at verse 18 with me and we'll throw it up on the screen. <clears throat> While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called to them, immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. These men come across Jesus. Jesus tells them, come and follow me. And they, like that, drop their nets and say, I'm gonna follow him. There was an immediate hope and faith that these men had to say, this is the one I'm gonna put my hope in. And they left behind their life and followed him. Look look what continues to happen on a bigger scale. Verse 23, and he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria. And they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and 
healed them. And great crowds followed him from Galilee to the Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. Jesus is gathering followers, right? He he is gathering these followers. He is gathering uh, this, this movement. And all of these people who would have started to come and follow him, everybody following him, they would have had a reason for why they were following him. Right? They would have had a reason for, okay, I'm following this person because I'm sick and I need healing. I'm following this person because I'm so curious what they're going to do. And they all had a reason of why they were following uh, him. And, and whether or not that reason was correct, whether or not it was aligned and their allegiance was in the right place, uh, was yet to be determined um, and yet to be tested. And, and I, I want us just to read the very first two verses of the Sermon on the Mount. <clears throat> This is what happens in chapter five. He's gathered, he's gathered these disciples individually who just have this faith to jump out of the boats and fall. He's gathered these crowds and multitudes. And, and then he does this. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. From here, we have the Sermon on the Mount. He gathered the crowds. He declared, this is about my kingdom. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then he began to teach them. What's happening on the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus Christ is giving his inaugural address. That's what's happening in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, The inaugural address is something that is very common to us if we've been paying attention in the last uh, seven days. Right, a a president gives an inaugural address. um, And when they do, they get up and they say, here's who I am, here's what I'm for, here's what I'm about, here's who we are as a people, here's what we believe in, here's where we're going. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is. It is our Savior, it is Jesus Christ giving his inaugural address to his people. Here's who he is, here's where he's going, here's who we are, here's how to follow. That's where he's going. But there's a danger in missing it. Right? There's a danger in missing it. Generation after generation misses it. There's a danger of missing where he's taking us and who he is on a daily basis in my life. I, I'm so quick to forget. There is a, a danger theologically and culturally where we miss it. Let me show you one of the things that happened even just through Christ and his closest disciples. In Matthew 22, in Matthew 22, it says this in verse 15. It's a story of Pharisees trying to trap Jesus. It's going to kind of give us a glimpse of some some misinterpretations of what Jesus was about. In verse 15, it says, Then the Pharisees, they went and plotted how to entangle him, Jesus, in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully, and you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, so they're buttering up and they're being real sweet. Tell us then, uh, what you think it is, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, says, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the taxes. And they brought him the denarii. So here's what's happening. They're like, we're going to get him. We're going to trick him. Uh, we don't like Jesus. They're the religious rulers. Jesus threatens the kingdom that they've been building in their religion Right? In, in their religion, they'd been building this religious kingdom, and, and now here Jesus is preaching this, this alternative kingdom that, that they don't know how it fits yet, and they don't understand. And so like, we're going to trap them. Let's ask them, hey, uh, should we pay taxes or not? And here's why that was a big deal. A um, uh, couple of generations before Jesus, uh, there was this massive revolt. Right? There was this massive revolt of Jewish people who had said, we don't like Rome and we're tired of being held captive by Rome. We're tired of being occupied by Rome. And so there was this big rebellion of people who were just upset and ticked. And they said, not only are we not paying taxes, we're gonna go hold up in a fort and we're gonna try to kick you guys out. And we're gonna try to, we're gonna try to overturn and kick Rome out of our land and get you out of here. And it was this huge thing and it was this rebellion that was squashed and squashed violently. And so they know, right, a lot of Jewish people They did not like Rome. Rome was not popular. And so they're trying to pin Jesus. Okay, are you gonna be anti-Rome or are you gonna be pro-Rome? Because if you're anti-Rome, there's gonna be a lot of people who are really 
frustrated because they hate the Roman government and they want no Roman government. They want the Roman government out of their lives. And so if you say that you're pro and we should start giving our taxes, then that kind of feels like you're a traitor, Jesus. But if you say you're anti-Rome, well then, I mean, that's treason, right? Then Rome's gonna get ticked if they find this guy out there and, and we can trap him either way, either by the Jewish people who will be upset that he's, that he's pro-Roman government or, or by the Romans who would think he's, he's trying to create a political rebellion. Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? On, on the coin that they handed him. They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God. When they heard it, they marveled and they left and they went away. Mic drop for Jesus moment, right? Just mic drops them, tricks them. Ah, man, we thought we had them and we didn't because what's happening? Because Jesus is saying, I'm not here for this political kingdom that you are stuck on. The, the temporary blinders that you first century Jews are stuck on and first century Romans are stuck on, I have a much, much bigger picture. So fine, Caesar's head is on the coin, then give it to Caesar, right? But what is God's, give it to God's. And what has God's image on it, that should pledge allegiance to God. And it's this great way that he, that he navigates that. Um, it's, it's beautiful, right? He, he's not political, He's not political. Um, And first century, uh, that would have been an incredibly uh, tight trap. But then look what happens, right? I I get it. It makes sense that they would have thought that, right? Even when you think of Isaiah 9 and the prophecy, and wait, this guy's gonna set up this government and sit on the throne of David and all these things. It would make sense that that happens. Fast forward. Fast forward. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he gets arrested. He's there with his disciples. He gets arrested. They show up to arrest him. Jesus, all knowing, knows it's gonna happen. And what happens? John chapter 18, 10 and 11. Here's what happens. As they're arresting Jesus, some of you might remember this story. Simon Peter, having a sword, which, hold on. What are you doing with a sword, man? Why, anybody have a sword in here? What are you doing with a sword in the Garden of Gethsemane? So there's something clearly that, that Peter's prepared for something that Jesus isn't ushering in. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus, which that's a bummer of a name. Let's be honest. That's a bummer of a name. And now he's only got one ear. He was already bullied for the name Malchus. Now he's going to be bullied for having one-eared Malchus. Regardless, this is what happens. Jesus says to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. And he says, shall I not drink the cup that the father has given me? And he, and he ends up healing this servant's ear. So Jesus' closest disciple, right? Peter, Jesus' right-hand man. At the, at the, after three years of following him, after three years of watching him preach the kingdom, still doesn't understand what's happening. He's got a sword with him when they go to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And as they arrest Jesus, Peter thinks, here we go. This, this is the time. This is the time for political violence. This is the time where we're not gonna let them take our savior. Pulls out a sword and chops off a guy's ear. See what happens when we get it wrong. See what happens when we get it, when our, when our kingdom alignment gets out of whack. This would, this would never happen current day, right? Like, no way, would we put our hope so much in a political leader? And if we lose him, man, we, we gotta take it by force. We gotta smash through doors, we gotta smash through windows. We gotta take our Jesus flag and our American flag and our Confederate flag and whatever flags we got, our Bucky's flag, and we gotta get in there because this is it. It reveals that, that it reveals that man, we've got our hope in the wrong thing, right? We got our hope in the wrong thing. What happened on the Capitol a couple of weeks ago? Man, we saw it and we grieved. And we saw men and women who who were fighting for what they thought was their kingdom slipping through their hands. And this was their hope. And if we don't take it back now, our hope is gonna be lost. And so there was a kingdom alignment out of whack. And what happened in the Capitol, I don't think was a, a... a political thing. I think it was a spiritual thing. I mean, I think they knew it, but I think it was a spiritual thing. I think it revealed where our hope is. 
And man, we, we've spent, some of us have spent four years putting our hope in something to be a savior that it was never designed to be. It's been a lot of time and a lot of energy making excuses for, compromising, maybe character, because we're putting our hope in some policies that we think are going to usher in a kingdom that Jesus says, that's my kingdom to usher. I'm the savior that's gonna usher in that kingdom. But generation after generation after generation has found ourselves putting our hope in a kingdom to say, but wait, this is it. And well, we'll look the other way here and okay, it doesn't quite look like Jesus and let's compromise here because maybe some of these things are gonna push towards the kingdom that we want. And there's a difference between being an advocate and being intelligent and being thoughtful and being political and a difference between where we find our hope and what allegiance we align with. And just to be fair, um, let's, let's, look at, let's look at Biden's administration. And we now have a president, whether you like it or not or voted for him, we have a president who who has run on this campaign of, I'm going to be the guy who restores from the bad guy. I'm going to be the guy who brings back the dignity and the healing that's needed. I mean, just about every political campaign. I mean, Trump did it. Obviously, Biden did it. Obama's whole thing was hope. That was his whole thing. Hope. We do it all the time, and we're prone to it, and we... We wander over and we think, well, this guy, man, he's going he's gonna to be the answer. Am I making an argument? Let me just say, I am not making an argument for us as believers to stop engaging in politics. To just say, well, it's Jesus' kingdom, so I'm not going to vote. I'm not going to care. I'm going to be cynical about it. No, if anything, I think the opposite. I think Christians should be more thoughtfully engaged in politics. I think we should vote and step forward. I think we are going to have to make compromises, whether with policy or character or personality, or those things are going to happen. We're going to have to make decisions because of, the, because of the very temporal, very imperfect worldly kingdom we live in. So we want to be good citizens of that kingdom. But as believers, we have a deeper allegiance. And so as we do that thoughtfully, really thoughtfully, we engage in politics maybe more and not just reactionary and not just based on our fear, but we engage as believers who have our hope in a kingdom and the witness that that is to the world around us, but also can engage in a way that brings glory to God, but also, yes, advocates and fights for, for what we might feel like pushes forward the best protection or policy or person that, that those convictions lead to. Man, when we get it wrong, though, our witness goes out the door to the world around us. Man, when we get it wrong, and that's such a hard thing because I think it's easy to be over -journal. It's easy to find one picture of a Jesus flag and a crowd of angry people and a witness for a lost people to think, there it is. They were worshiping the wrong Savior. It's, it's dangerous. It's important. Sermon on the Mount is going to talk a lot about how important our witness is and that as citizens of the kingdom, we are on display we are light, we are salt, we are on display for the world to see us. And that is a really important, but really fine line to walk. But he gives us how to walk that in this sermon. He gives it. Um, now I, I should say this too. I know people who are left who love Jesus politically. They're left and they love Jesus. And I know people who are right and far right and they love Jesus, but they also can point to where their hope is. And, and we're revealed, aren't we? We're revealed of where we've put our hope by how we react, how we respond, how we engage and how we fight. Here's the deal. You, if you are pledging allegiance to the wrong kingdom, you will be disappointed. Jesus gives us that promise. You will be left wanting. If you end up finding yourself pledging your allegiance, putting your hope in a false kingdom, you will be left uh, wanting. This is Christ's kingdom that he's bringing out. Don't miss it. That's what the Sermon on the Mount is it is his address, his inaugural address to say, here we go, this is what it looks like. It's how to be a citizen, how to gain citizenship. For 19 weeks, we'll spend time on what it looks like to be a citizen, what it looks like to have a kingdom ethic that Christ had built, what it looks like to have the warnings of Jesus, of how you fall out of that, or how you get tricked and duped, and how you build your foundation correctly. That's what he does 
for the next three chapters. And so what we're gonna spend the next 19 weeks digging deep. God, help us be believers who engage in the world around us in thoughtful ways and don't put our head in the sand, but also we find our hope in the right place and that's you. It would be proper citizens of it. So um, I have a few questions I'm gonna end on for you guys. <clears throat> where is your hope? Right, where is your hope? The, the political thing that's happened in our country is, is low hanging fruit. We, we see that and we, we realize that and I think I can check my heart and we can all look at that, but I think there's way more application to this, to this call of Christ's kingdom than just how I engage in that sphere of the world. So I'd ask you, where do you find your hope? Is it, um, is it in a job that you have? Is it in the possibility of a job? Is it in the next step that you're looking for? Is it in that status of, man, if I could only get this. And when you ask yourself, and I want you tonight, as we go back into worship here in just a little bit, to ask yourself, Lord, would you reveal, now, if you took this away, would I crumble? Would I react in such an ungodly way? Would I fall apart? Have I put my hope in a career? Have I put my hope in an amount of money to make or a status that I'm waiting to get? Have I, have I put my hope in, a, in the approval of other people? And man, approval is so sneaky because I think, no, nah, no, I don't. And then all of a sudden, I, I, I kind of don't get invited to something or I kind of get left out of something. And then all of a sudden, I think, oh no, that hurts way disproportionately than it feels like it should. And I realize, man, I've got part of my hope in, in wanting these people to approve of me. Maybe we find our hope. Honestly, maybe we find our hope in substances, right? I need this to take away what is hurting. I, I drink this. I look at this on my computer because I know there can be immediate gratification if I go down those roads of lust and maybe it's that, maybe it's pornography in your life that in some ways you have said, man, my hope is in that. That's what I go to, to relieve what burdens me. That's, that's the government that I submit to, to say, help me. And it's these things that we know leave us empty and we know leave us wrecked. And they can be unhealthy, but man, the, the sneaky thing about, about this idolatry in our heart is um, they can be the healthiest things in the world, but we still... They're still not designed to be our kingdom. Maybe it's relationships, right? Maybe it's relationships and that, that one relationship has to work or that elusive relationship I'm waiting for and we constantly surrender, but it's also constantly nagging at us. Constantly nagging at us because if, if only I could and if only we could and if only this would happen and we find our hope there. We serve a God who has shown up and entered into our broken world and all of our broken temporary systems and loved us where we are. And we in Christ, and what we'll see in the Sermon on the Mount is that we have a king who sits on the throne and it is a kingdom unlike any other kingdom. And it's not a political kingdom, although I believe one day it will be a political kingdom that he will usher in. But he sits on that throne. But here's the other thing, and here's the beautiful thing. We have a king who then, from his kingdom, became a sacrificial lamb for us. For his people, that king that we have, that we know is worthy, became a sacrificial lamb and hung on a cross and died so that we might enter into citizenship with him. That's what we have right, for you. Not only is he worthy, if you hear anything I say, I hope that you hear what I'm about to say and I hope it continues to ring in your ears all night and I hope it continues to ring in your ears every day constantly. We have a king who is worthy and not just worthy, we have a king who is good. And we have a king who is good and not just a king who is good, we have a king who is gracious, he became the lamb of God so that we might be able to approach him. Not because we earned it. And so what that means is for you, sitting here watching this sermon, it means no matter how far you've wandered, no matter how many other kingdoms you have found your allegiance in, 
no matter how many other things you've put your hope in, it means that we have a God who says, I still love you. And as a king, because of the lamb of God, you can still approach me. You can still be with me where you were designed to be. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the lamb of God was that powerful? No matter how far you've wandered, no matter what you've done, no matter what your past looks like, you have a king who is gracious and says, come. That is the king we worship. Let me pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for how you have loved us, Father. You are worthy and you are good and, um, and you, are, you are reigning, God. You are in control. And God, if we're honest with ourselves tonight, Father, um, we know there's conviction in our heart. We know there's other things that we have certainly put our hope in, whether they are little or whether they are Huge, would you, in your kindness, be the kind of father that reveals those to us? And then would we be able to acknowledge that, yes, you've purchased those? And would we run back to pledge our allegiance to you? You are our king. Would you do the work that only you can do in our hearts for your glory, in the name of Jesus, amen. Tribes of earth will mourn, sun 
the man who waits is coming on the clouds. The trumpet will resound. We'll fall onto our knees, and every heart will bow. The sun and moon will fade. The stars will fall away. The tribes of
put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. I put my faith in Jesus, my anchor to the ground, my hope and firm foundation. He'll never let me down. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your rising sun, setting sail. that would we believe that he is faithful he's never let us down he's never he's never not kept any of his promises to us would tonight our faith increase not because of a not because of a song and not because of a sermon not because of community but would increase because of the power of the holy spirit because we have a spirit who lives in us if We have aligned ourselves with his kingdom that says, great is your name. You are worthy. You are worth it. Man, if you are like me, um, I've got a laundry list of business to do with the Lord of other places that I put my faith, that I know are going to leave me dry, that I know aren't worth where I put my hope. And those allegiances get off. They, They get out of line. So my challenge, our challenge for you is don't leave this room and, until you do business with God. Don't leave this room until you said, Lord, where have I just gotten out of alignment? Where are my allegiances? Where, where do I find myself putting my hope and my faith and for my security and my comfort? Is it you or is it these things that I know are gonna be dust one day? whether you've been walking with the Lord for a long time and there's some areas that he wants to realign tonight or whether you've been chasing after something, looking for something and tonight for the first time he says, I have the kingdom that you have been looking for. We wanna encourage you to pray. Go before the Lord boldly, bring that to him. We'll be down front. We'd love to pray with you. If you just wanna stay in your seat and pray, that's fine too. But know what you're doing and know who you're praying to. You're praying to a gracious God. A gracious God who takes old things and he makes them new. That's who you're praying to. A God who says, I have never stopped loving you. No matter how many times we have betrayed him and gotten off track, I have never stopped loving you. That's the God we approach tonight. So these guys will lead one more song. And then, um, and then when they end this song, they'll dismiss us. And if you would, leave quietly. When, when you need to leave, leave, but leave quietly um, and let this room be a place for people like me who have business to do with the Lord. And then they'll continue to play over us as long as we need tonight. Let's leave here changed for his glory. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your faithfulness, God. Thank you that we can sing about it. Thank you that we can hear about it. Lord, help my heart believe. Help my heart believe. And thank you that you are a God who does take people who are We're just sinful and broken and you take us and you love us still. You have such immense grace for us and you call us to something sweet and you make something new out of what was old. We are grateful. We are yours in the name of Jesus. In the pressing, you are making a new wine. 
in the soil I now surrender you are breaking new ground so I trust you I don't need to understand make me a vessel make me an offering make me whatever you want me to be I came here with nothing but all you have given me Jesus bring out of me in the crushing in the pressing you are making a new wine in the soil I now surrender you are brave new ground you are breaking new ground so make me your vessel make me an offering make me whatever you want me to be God I came here with nothing but all humility we can look at your word and look at, and see that you have set up a kingdom that glorifies you that uplifts your character that uplifts your name and it doesn't have our names written on the banner of glory and so Lord won't you continue to refine us as this song says won't you crush us and press us that we might be made to be more like you not so that we can be pummeled and crushed but so that we can be turned into a new wine something that is pleasing to you, a fragrant offering to you, God, and an ointment to men, salt and light to the world. And so, God, we receive it even now. That what you want to do to us, Lord, though the days might be tough, though the seasons that we're in might be long and hard, God, we know that your word says that you work all things together for the good of those who 
love you and are called according to your purposes. And so, Lord, we here as your people, your children, your church, your bride, ask to be made more like you, that we could be made more holy, more righteous, more in your image, that we can submit to a better kingdom than the one here on earth. And so, Lord, won't you let that happen even here now as we pray before you and submit our hearts to you, God. Seek from you, to hear from you. Lord, we trust you. We want to follow you. And so if that's not our song yet, God, we pray that you would move in our hearts, that it can be our song, that we will follow you anywhere. Because your word says that where you're going, we want to be. So we ask it in Jesus' name for your glory, Lord, our Savior. Amen. We love you guys. It is a joy to be here with you guys uh, every time we're able to gather. Stay and pray if you need to. And as Ben said, leave quietly if you need to leave. We love you guys. We can't wait to see you guys in, in our home groups next week.